Hey guys, welcome back to the CyberDoc podcast. In this episode, we will be interviewing the founder of GhostSec. GhostSec is a vigilante hacking group that has been active for a while and gained mainstream notoriety in 2015 when they shut down and defaced hundreds of ISIS websites and social media accounts in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attacks that took place in Paris in 2015. We'll be delving deep into the history of the group, their motivations, and the various topics pertinent to cybersecurity. So, without further ado, let's get started. Resistance is not terrorism. We will dedicate this speech to remind you why you started this and to give out some advice. We will not allow this revolution to go off track. Timing is key, and this is the perfect time for a reminder. Remember that a secular state purports to be neutral in matters of religion, supporting neither religion nor irreligion. It does not mean that it is against religion. Remember that your so-called leaders are war criminals. They claim that they unite and protect you, but in reality, it's quite the opposite. Remember that what you are demanding in the streets are not requests. They are basic human rights. To the crowd who still follow their leaders unquestioningly, Remember that your rights were taken away from you by your leaders. What you were giving in return for your freedom was already yours to begin with. Break out of this tyranny and get a taste of freedom. We promise you that in the future is brighter without them. You don't need them. They need you. Nothing can kill the voice of freedom. And you, you are the voice of freedom. Fight your hardest for you are the hope of your own country. Resistance is not terrorism. We are GhostSec. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. GhostSec has given you the truth. Do what you will. All right. Uh, so really, really excited to have you on. Uh, so I've been following you guys uh, for quite a while now, especially on social media. And uh, you know, I've been keeping track of your engagements and your various hacks. Um, could you, you know, give us an introduction as to who you are and how you got started with GhostSec? I started GhostSec, me and another founder of Ghost331, we started GhostSec at around 2014. And since then, everything has been history, pretty much. All right, cool. Um, so just generally speaking, how long have you been working uh, in the InfoSec industry? Since around 2013. Right. Okay. And uh, what what do you do primarily um, as as a job, or what industry do you work in specifically? Uh, penetration testing is a whole. You know, that's the term that's being used. So, yeah. All right. Um, so I get. I guess uh, my next question would be, uh, what exactly does GhostSec do right now, and what motivates you guys? You know, given the uh, the legal repercussions that you face um, for your actions. Yeah, well, GoSec now we're actually a activist group, right? And we've been in many, how do I explain this, many movements that happen, many operations that we joined and started as well. And what motivates us, we actually can support people and can help people through our work. You know, giving a voice to the voiceless was the reason GoSec started to begin with. And for example, we have Operation Child Safety, which is still ongoing. And through Operation Child Safety, we managed to get pedophiles arrested, uh, CP websites shut down, uh, teen chat websites where they're infested with pedophiles. We had those shut down. Uh, missing kids, if we'd find any through OSINT, we'd immediately you know, report to the parents like, hey, this person could possibly be here, report it to the police, blah, blah, blah. And we also supported other activists for doing Operation Child Safety in tracking down pedophiles as well. So overall, it's that we can give a voice to the voiceless and support people through our work. Okay, that's, that's excellent. Um, right. So uh, f from that point on, could you give us a bit of a history of GhostSec and how it was started? And, uh, you know, what was the motivation behind it in the beginning? Uh, GhostSec started off originally as a group that was fighting against police brutality at first, right? And we did have also some hacks against hospitals. And our first purpose of these two things, you know, we were doing basic things to try and support, once again, people that 
needed our support until the Charlie Hebdo attack, which then we switched our focus into attacking ISIS through instead of just, you know, during Operation ISIS, many of the um, many people that were involved in the operation would just report the accounts or deface the website. Our approach was very different as we found OSINT to be important. So, um, so the way we did it was different from others. We checked the intel, we re read the accounts, scraped the metadata off the pictures, checked you know, the background of the picture. If something looks like, hey, we know where this is, let's check Google Maps or whatever. So overall, we started off through that way and we grew, we grew using you know, the way we started. All right. Uh, yeah. So thank you for answering that. Um, my next question uh, is sort of uh, related to something that you mentioned uh, earlier on, which was, uh, you know, your motivations for the attacks. And you briefly mentioned police brutality and, uh, you know, pedophilia as well as government corruption. Uh, you know, the second question would be, uh, you know, you, would you consider yourself a hacktivist group uh, at this point? And if so, uh, what are your political uh, or economic ideologies that motivate you? Uh, and if you don't have any, uh, then what really is the determining factor behind who you target? On top of our, you know, vigilante work with pedophiles, ISIS and police brutality, we also have operations against, let's say, a country's government corruption, corruption in the uh, country itself, child trafficking in a certain country. Overall, our focus isn't just the three things I mentioned, but we also have, you know, any corruption that we find through governments or from a country itself, we start to target. As well, we we targeted other things like big applications that seem to corrupt big corps, things like that. All right, so that's uh, cleared up a few things for me. So I just have one question regarding, uh, you know, government attacks because you briefly mentioned them there. And what I'm wondering is, uh, what exactly motivates you? Or what is the criteria for attacking government, right? So do you attack governments, um, you know, to expose corruption, to expose blatant corruption? Or uh, do you hack governments uh, because they have uh, lax security or they're really not protecting their citizens' data? 100% on top of corruption and things like that, if we find, you know, a system that's vulnerable and we're okay, but this is a government that's known worldwide you know for example we have uh the canada revenue agency basically canada irs so the cra and we did have a leak where we hacked them in november 2020 we posted a small leak from the information we got off the machines and believe it or not the way we accessed them was through an rdp that had a very simple password okay it's very it was shocking at the time as well now on top of you know corruption and all when we Post things like to, to say like, "Hey, your security is crap. Get, get it fixed." You know. So, um, given the nature of your, of your attacks and the fact that you know you're dealing with companies and organizations, have you ever dealt with any legal repercussions for your actions, um, or have you had, had any blowback from any government uh, that uh, that you've attacked? Not directly to us. No, I. Uh have seen you know i have seen others that we had connections with and contact with we have seen some of them you know either get arrested or stories out there that they've been arrested have court seeings whatnot and when it comes to you know our side of hacking compared to the infosec field and all where you guys have a very limited amount of risk correct in our side we take opsec procedures very very strictly and we think that you know any mistake can lead to our demise, can lead to the end of our run, basically. Mm -hmm. And so we 100% we take OPSEC very seriously and we make sure that no matter what happens, we don't mess something up. Even if we're rushed or anything, we have to keep our OPSEC first, so that way we don't screw ourselves later. So the procedure goes as we must take our time. There's no such thing as rush. Even though we may have a few minutes, like if that few minutes is enough for you, take the time to take your OPSEC right, clear the metadata, use proxy chains or VPN to make sure no slightest mistakes is going to come back to haunt us. So that's how it goes. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon uh, OPSEC in a few minutes. Uh, I just have a few questions regarding your methodology behind the attacks, right? So uh, 
how do you start your attacks and how do you decide on you know who you're targeting next is there is this is this a sort of like a system behind that or uh, is, are you know is this corruption brought up to you directly so how, how exactly do you do you pick your next target well recently through gosex um, how we've started growing okay because of the activists started reaching out to us in terms of you know this country has corruption this is happening check this hashtag on twitter you'll see all the details whatever it's things like that recently that was happening but before that we had to check into countries individually and start reading the news we were actually following many news uh, sites and all and we were checking through those as well as since you know our attack soap is much different from the infosec field we have a much much wider and larger attack scope we're able to, when targeting, for example, a government or a corporation, we have more things to look at, which could be more vulnerable than a normal. Right, right. Okay, so you, you've mentioned a, a larger scope. So uh, once you've picked your target, right, um, what's next? Do you, do you start by, by performing a ton of o OSINT uh, and information gathering, or how exactly do you prepare for an engagement yeah, after? Yeah, that's the start, you know, OSINT yeah. and information gathering. We start looking into the domains, you know, the people. We start looking into everything that we can find. And after that, we start, you know, researching, checking for vulnerabilities manually, automatically testing. And after that, we have the exploitation stage, lateral movement, you know, the usual process as it goes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, okay, so if, if, if after that, uh, that particular phase, if it follows the, the usual pen testing methodology, uh, when does it start, uh, uh, you know, diverging uh, from, from the standard pen testing methodology? Is it after, you know, post exploitation? Is it during the post exploitation phase? Or privilege escalation. So, uh, m my real question here is, uh, when does it start getting, you know, way different uh, as opposed to if if this was a standard penetration test? After we get what we're looking for, right? So when we get into a machine, we start downloading anything that we can find, pretty much, since we don't have time to spend looking through. You know, if we enter a machine, right, or uh, a website's database or something. We won't spend time checking through one by one. We'd start dumping or downloading everything that we can, and we check them on our own time from our ends instead. So that's when things start to get different. Is when we start to like um, install the loot to our end. Okay. Okay. And then after that, it starts to get different even more when we start to leak these stuff because normally this stuff doesn't get disclosed, leaked on your end. Even if we find a vulnerability, normally for the infosec field or bug bounty um, hunters, they won't disclose it publicly as they're not allowed to due to, let's say, a contract or something. But on our end, we post these files, these um, private details, everything. We start to leak these to the public and show this is what's going on. Check this out, right? For example, in Nigeria, we had a leak where we showed um, the government embezzling and laundering money. Yeah. So, these are the type of things that start to get different. I think uh, you, you've just brought up a very good topic, and of course, that's the the whole conversation behind ethics and uh, and you know when, when when performing engagements. And of course, as you've mentioned before, uh, what morals or or what um, what axioms do you guys hold in your group that that sort of make up the the ethics whenever you go into an engagement? Are you are you uh, are you only doing it? Uh, you know, so so that you can reveal corruption or you know crimes uh, being perpetuated by organizations, companies, or groups, or are you motivated by uh, or or you know are you motivated mo motivated by any, uh, other other aspects? With posing corruption, and everything right. We are motivated by anything else. We draw our moral lines when it starts to harm the innocents more than it would benefit them. Right? Okay. Like I said, we started the group based off giving a voice to people that are voiceless. You know, that's that's the reason we started this group, to support people that needed our support in any way or needed our motivation or the way we could push them to what they need, right? Right. And we draw the line when things start to become more harmful to them than it is benefiting them. For example, hospitals or schools. Those are, you know, schools would stop education, so that's a no-go. Hospitals could disrupt uh, things, could lead to death. Lots of things can happen when you start targeting a hospital, so that's also a no. And there's other things that we start to draw the line on. Mr. When things start to get dangerous for the protesters, for example, 
government start to shoot at the protesters, that's when we start to feel we start to feel responsible that we push them to the point where they're starting to get shot at by the government. Right, right. That's um, that's good to hear because you know uh, many many groups usually uh, don't have uh, you know the the type of um, the, of the of ethics or you know moral lines that you guys have just uh, spoken about. And I think it's great that you 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 take the uh, you know the the whole ethos of protecting the innocent, uh, you know, and and having that as as your core. Uh, principle behind your attacks and and uh, you know wh- whether or not you're you're causing them any da- any damage is, is a factor. So uh, that's really good to hear. Now, uh, as as I said before, or one of the you know one of the questions I wanted to get in earlier um, was uh, you know whenever you're performing your attacks, uh, wh- what type of infrastructure do you deploy for your attacks? Uh, do, do you do you set up uh, you know virtual private servers? We do have VPSs, obviously, to also store our data and everything else that we could find. So, yeah, in a way, we do have um, VPSs. Okay, we also have some other things that we do. Uh, we have a C2 server set up on one of the VPSs. And overall, it just shows, you know, we also take things seriously on our end as well. As the procedure goes, like, OPSEC must always come into place. And... When coming up the strategies like setting up VPS and C2 servers and storing the loot for data exfiltration, I must uh, first conduct, uh, I have to talk to Seb about this before we do something about it. As the strategy goes, and so we've seen, we've, uh, I'm sorry if I stuttered sometimes, so forgive me for that. We always try to conduct uh, a lot of strategies to make sure everything gets, everything is right for data exfiltration and post exploitation to expect what kind of vulnerabilities we're gonna encounter and do we have to remit, maintain persistence? Like, what kind of persistence do we need? Do we have to create a user account? Do we have to get a golden, golden ticket of the Mimi Cat? Which sometimes, because you know, companies sometimes they overlook that because it's going to last forever. Like maybe such as ten years for a golden ticket of Mimi. All right. So that was uh, very well put. Um, so thank you for that. Um, one of the questions that I have, and this is sort of aimed towards you guys is um, what elements are important for you when it comes down to OPSEC and what are some of the precautions that you guys take, um, you know, when uh, when conducting assessments in order to, uh, again, maintain your op- operational security? Right. So first off, nothing should be in clear text. That's an obvious rule. Everything You should have everything encrypted to begin with. Um, route everything you do, you know, for our activities, we have things routed, we route our machines through Hunix, right? Mm. Uh, we use proxy chains and VPNs as well, depending on what we're doing, because sometimes you need more speed and Hunix doesn't provide that. So either way, we always have many rules set up for us. We don't talk about things going on before, like if it's something that we didn't leak yet or something that we probably never will leak, right? We don't talk about it publicly. We won't announce it. We won't disclose it. It's something for us. Then, yeah, we keep our mouth shut. And it's a, that, that's actually an important rule, as I've seen lots of people mess up in that rule, especially, that to keep your mouth shut, right? You should not talk about things going on. Right. And right. Uh, sure then there's other, yeah, like there's uh, other things. Like, uh, make sure you don't get carried away. Like, operation security is about not to reveal your classified information. Ask, like, you know, how the government agency does that, so keep your mouth shut at all costs. Like, Ziva, do not ever get carried away. Exactly. Even to your friends that you know, for example, offline, then you know on the online, right? If mm-hmm. they don't know your, what you do, then there's no need to bring it up. There's no need to speak about it, right? It, the more the people, the more the liability. So the way we take OPSEC, instead of, you know, just instead of uh, Hunix and all that, what I mentioned, we also have. Our identities online and offline do not mix in any occasion. Mm. We take our chat room seriously, all of that. You know, we make sure we chat in a private place that's a secured chat as well. So we make sure we take all our procedures properly before we start doing anything. Right, right. Okay, that's uh, that's a great um, that's a great answer. Um, right. So. Uh, you know, getting back to the core of the discussion when, you know, we're talking about governments and organizations, uh, from your own experience, do you think that governments are doing enough to protect their citizens' data? 
Not at all. I feel governments are more into invasion of privacy as we move forward with time. And in the future, there will be nothing called privacy from the way we see it. You know, moving forward, privacy will become more and more lost as time continues. And as of right now as well, we see there's all these procedures that needs to be taken to keep our privacy, right? Even advertisers, you know, not just governments, but even advertisers now have access to our privacy. They start having access to our data to use it for uh, data science and data analytics to start recommending things to us, to start finding out when we're probably going to order our next orders. The only thing that's missing by now is that to guess whether our girlfriend's going to cheat on us or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. so consider this, uh, this world has become a video game as Watch Dogs 2, or even better, Cyberpunk 2077. You'll be found in an instance in a surveillance state. So, I will not be surprised if social medias like Twitter, or Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, or any centralized social media, your... I say your data is already collected from the very beginning before you even realize, including Windows 10 computers. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, so, so some of these uh, social media sites and even some operating systems are literally like telemetry devices that are collecting or have been collecting tons of data about you for a while. Um, I, th I think what, what you just mentioned is um, is very interesting. Um, if, you know, if if the governments are moving in that direction where they, they want to, you know, get rid of, as, uh, you know, privacy and have everything out in the open, um do you think that uh, they're, they're going to facilitate or they're going to do this through technology, as you said, by, you know, uh, interconnecting us even more or introducing devices that may double down as surveillance devices uh, or will, will, will they be will they be going in a more oppressive manner? Well, the surveillance states. Oh, my God, this is an interesting question. To the government who's trying to collect the data about us with using social media as their tool like Facebook or Twitter, chances are you're already toast because they're going to use this to expose whistleblowers, activists, hacktivists, anything they're trying to remove and strip the powers from away from the corrupted governments. They're going to do it at all costs. Right, right. Okay. And on top of that, yeah, on top of that, the way the governments will start, you know, it won't be in a manner where they're going to be forcing it down on us but there's things like for example in, you know the internet of things many new devices are coming out that are connected through the internet uh, smart fridges cameras you know even the little cleaning robot thing mm -hmm. <laughs> all those things that come with internet of things they're also a liability like i remember reading an article on one of the roombas i think they're called and, yeah uh, was attacked and got exposed for having a mic built into it. And, you know, when you think about it, why does a vacuum have a microphone? It just doesn't add up, right? Yeah. Or yeah. devices like, you know, virtual reality started getting bigger. And when we say reality, Facebook are getting to the scene of virtual reality with um, Oculus. And whoever has an Oculus, for example, headset at home, the headset, when it's on, can see your environment can hear everything that's going in the background. Smart TVs can hear what's going on in the background. Uh, smart cameras and all these types of things overall. You know, it'll, it'll, we won't we won't notice it, but it's happening in the back. Right, right. That's a thing. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so we have uh, we, we've talked a little bit about um, you know government and organizational security and. Um, and various aspects of OPSEC. Uh, just wanted to ask you whether you've encountered any companies or governments that have, uh, you know, a decent level of security. And of course, that, that's a relative term, but in your opinion, were you ever left impressed by the level of security or is it really just, you know, really bad? <laughs> uh, most, of the time, <laughs> most of the time, it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, but it was one time we had... Uh something with a Chinese server we found, right? And yeah, we were doing something with the server. Okay, I don't want to like disclose too much. But about 10 minutes in and their security team, we, uh, they changed the password to the thing, right? And it was, it was very interesting how they had quick response mm -hmm. compared to all of our previous and other attacks. You know, it's interesting to see like, 
oh god, these guys are working around the clock. I thought we timed this properly. We were supposed to have enough time to at least get something out of it. We didn't have time. We logged in uh, the machine. We started looking around, whatnot. And then immediately after that, we got uh, kicked out of the machine and we couldn't get back in. We made ourselves a uh, login. Uh, we couldn't use that either. It was very interesting to see, like, okay, they have quick response times. You know, it's, it's, so China had an interesting way of combating us. Mm -hmm. As well, there is some sites, you know, um, not just sites, but also corporations as a whole that have a decent level of security when it comes to things. But then you eventually find something very stupid, like, oh, an API key got leaked. And you're like, oh, well, here it goes. It's time for us to shine again. We thought they were <laughs> secure until we see like an API key leaked or something simple. Yeah. It was always the simple things that end up happening. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that that that's a that's a good point you just mentioned there. Uh, do do you think like um, one of the issues that companies are dealing with now, especially you know with 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 them migrating most of their operations to the cloud and you know setting up digital infrastructure, is the whole idea of of secrets management and the fact that uh, you know they they their developers or even administrators uh, really don't know how to manage the complexity behind you know the, behind these systems and as a result you as you pointed out you get various things like api keys being leaked or various you know github repositories or github credentials uh, do, 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 do you see that uh, becoming even more prevalent or yeah 100 percent. i mean we see it very often okay and even for big things like for example we can take getter for an example with some social media platform that was created by a trump executive right and it was supposed to be used to combat twitter and unfortunately under 24 hours since it's released the api key got leaked the encryption keys got leaked for the wait and it goes to show that even like someone as high as trump couldn't manage a team good enough to prevent such simple things Mm -hmm. Yeah, public, you know. Yeah, so that's uh, been causing uh, companies quite a bit of issues. Um, so I just want to, you know, change gear or redirect uh, some of the questions, uh, you know, to a more personal basis, uh, you know, and some of them may be based uh, on advice that you can give. Um, so, you know, my audience uh, primarily on this channel is, uh, you know, offensive, uh, is geared towards uh, the offensive. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what advice uh, would you give, uh, you know, penetration testers in regards to the skills that they need to learn or master to become better uh, or to improve their, their, their skill set? Enumeration and exploitation, 100%, you know. Uh, like I know the attack scope is limited, but don't make that make like make you feel overwhelmed at what you can do and how much information you can gather. Gather anything anyways. You know, gather everything you can anyways, right? Even if you're not gonna use it for later or you're not gonna be exploiting these things, just gather things, you know, anyways. Um exploitation, I recommend, you know, looking into exploit development, fuzzing and all these other things. So overall, I think these two fields are pretty important. All right, good, good point there. Um, right, so just moving back, you know, slightly into the uh, the area of um, of companies and organizations. Uh, do you do you think, uh, or do you still hold the view that employees are still the biggest weakness within the organizational security of a company? One hundred percent. You know. Either it's, you know, basic passwords, phishing, they left the uh, key public, or you know, overall basic things that are made by human errors rather than, um, rather than it being from the website itself or from the machine. Human errors are still very, very commonly found. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one, 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 one of the highlights that, uh, you know, that actually encapsulates the experience with with most companies. Whenever you go and perform an engagement, uh, you know, pen test engagement for a company, uh, the, you know, for, for for the companies that are small to medium sized, uh, they really don't have any security policy, um, and you know that that of course leaves the employees vulnerable, uh, not only in terms of the company accounts, uh, but also their personal accounts. Uh, and yeah, I think that's one of the biggest issues I've seen. So, um, just uh, you know, just shifting gears slightly, 
Um, you know, this is a question that I wanted to ask. It's uh, quite important or pertinent to me. Um, so in your opinion, what are the most vulnerable sectors that are, you know, susceptible to attacks today? Is it the healthcare sector, the financial sector, uh, the manufacturing sector, um, or even, even governmental organizations or subsidi subsidiaries? Well, I'd say, no, it depends really, because we've been, financial has some issues, you know, we've gotten some things through there. Manufacturing sectors, definitely, you know, I've seen lots of um, manufacturers, factories, uh, car companies that, you know, manufacture cars and everything. Those also get targeted a lot and they don't take security very seriously since they are too busy on manufacturing or their factory running and all that. But government sectors as well, 100% have an issue through their websites rather than their machines, you know. Each, each has their own issue. We don't look at medical sectors, so I can't give my opinion on that. But each sector definitely has its own issues right in a different way final financial sectors has their own things manufacturer sectors have their own issues and government sectors have their own ways to be dealt with right all three of those there's definitely you know each one is more unique than the other there's no way of saying like oh this is the easiest thing or this is the easiest one we can break into because yeah there's a chance that a financial or manufacturing sector is much it's more secure than a government site or machine for example right right okay um so you know you you, you mentioned it earlier you know the the lack security of governments uh, you know their networks their websites etc why do you think that is the case you know we, you know given the amount of funding that, that 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 a government has available or has allotted to it why don't they take security seriously the answer is simple, you know, until dark side started hitting USA really, really hard, right? The USA, like before that, they didn't come out with a genuine cybersecurity program, for example. But after that, I'm pretty sure not just the USA, but many countries started coming with, we need people that work in cybersecurity to come to work for the government, or we need, uh, they started like having large recruitment campaigns and everything to influence people to work with government. And on top of that, people in this field as well don't generally like to work with the government. So the government ends up having to get people that aren't motivated to do their jobs or um, aren't experienced enough or interested enough to work with the government in that case. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. I think it's, uh, it's, it's been... It's been quite a long time since the you know any government has taken it seriously and you still find you know multiple governments and even even companies you know for for the most part that really don't take it seriously and i'm i'm just wondering you know yeah. personally speaking uh what would it take ideally apart from being attacked or getting hacked what would it take to actually you know get them to start securing their their the assets awareness 100 percent. it has to be awareness you know when a company goes and sees things like uh governments being hacked or uh, the pipelines getting hacked by dark side or the Kessia ransomware or things like that okay they should start looking at these articles and these things that are coming and see them as awareness like okay we might be in danger as well you know it's definitely an issue with awareness as well you know it's 100 percent tough and also and also uh, there's a better approach for this the only way to step up your defenses is to hire securing consultant to perform red teaming operations to check any kind of vulnerability even the slightest it doesn't matter if it's a human error or a securing vulnerability if that's the thing that you need to fix it you'll have to exploit it and understand the process how can you mitigate this Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so again, this is a question directed at you. Um, and of course, you can answer it uh, based on your own personal opinion. But uh, what advice 
would you give to you know to to companies in regards to how they should set up their security policy and how they should deal with security in general instead of just focusing on you know automation and checking making sure that your website or your machines secure having you know the latest antivirus you know, making it have machine learning or ai to detect the behavior of uh, malware so that even if it's encrypted or sorry, even if it's like obfuscated, it won't get detected. Instead of just having all these things, you should also focus on, um, also focus on testing your employees, right? Making sure that they also secure themselves instead of, of just you know, your machines and your websites. You should also have your employees to make sure they're secured. Check, for example, if you have open source codes, make sure there's no API keys there or check your website, everything. In general, they should be double checking check the humans obviously check your employees all that and once again manually check everything yourself don't don't get the order like yeah it's it's good don't worry and then there's no double check no nothing and later on they get bit in the ass you know what i'm saying <laughs> so yeah that's definitely the message i would give to them okay all right so uh that concludes our interview with gosec so thank you very very much for joining me and answering all these questions and uh, I'll be you know, looking forward to talking to you guys again. Thank you very much for watching or listening to this episode of the CyberTalk podcast. You can subscribe to this podcast through the Apple Podcasts uh, store or page. Uh, additionally, we also have the RSS feed uh, to this podcast added in the description section of this particular video episode. So you can subscribe using any podcast application that you use. Our podcast is also available on Spotify if you prefer streaming it there. And I'll be seeing you in the next episode.